Today, we are privileged to meet a global leader who's left her mark in the fields of journalism, diplomacy, and international development. Join me as I get to know the life and work of Gisette Sheeran, the president of the Asia Society. Gisette, so good to have you with us. Great to be here. <laughs> Well, listen, this is Asian. As you know, we almost invariably start with family. I want to talk about your father as a World War II hero. Tell us how that influenced your childhood and your views on life. He really taught us that we have to stand up for what we believe in the world, that we have to get involved in the world. And I think that experience, the book is called No Surrender. And really the message of the book is to stick to your values and fight for what is right in the world. And he really taught that to us. He also learned in that experience that we have to learn and respect people of other cultures. And so in my family, the worst thing you could do is to um, disrespect someone. And especially if it was the person holding the garbage or doing the elevator, if we treated them with disrespect, we were not my father's daughter anymore. And we knew that, so he had a big influence in my life. Well, a lot of his experiences are molded in adversity, but also as you were, as you were growing up, the world was changing. Mm -hmm. One of the things you mentioned to us earlier was about a, phone, a particular phone call with your father. <laughs> Tell us what it was all about and how that influenced your life. Well, all during his life, my father really loved Asia, and he gave free legal services to Asians who were trying to get to the U.S. and were in trouble, maybe emigrating from war situations. And he got a chance to go to China in 1979, and he made one phone call from China to me, and I was his daughter, very interested in the world. And he um, said to me, very simply, change your life, this is the future. And I remember under his encouragement going to China a couple of years later and coming in from the airport in Beijing behind a donkey cart. It took forever to get in on a single lane road and all the millions of bicycles of China, not seeing any cars and everyone was in gray suits. There was no color in the entire country and there was only really one hotel in Beijing for foreigners. And I just remember saying to him, this is the future. And he said to me something very important. He said, you don't have eyes to see yet. I have to teach you how to see. And um, you know, he was right, Asia was rising. And I was glad then to really change my focus to really learn about China and Asia way early in my life. Well, back then, the region and China itself was on the verge, you know, nobody could really see it as well and perceive it, but it was on the verge of all this massive development. But, you know, that's been a constant theme throughout your life to the point that even in the private sector from your journalistic and management career, it sort of never left you, right? I mean, mm -hmm. can you talk about your rise in the corporate world and the, your journalistic fields and then your move into government? Well, I think this really goes back a little bit to my parents and how I was raised because I don't think I have the fear gene in me. I think I, I thrive in really being a pioneer of new situations and discovering parts of the world or industries or ideas that the world hasn't really looked at and trying to give them a platform in the world. So this has been really important to me uh, throughout my career, which was in journalism. I traveled to war zones throughout the, throughout the world. and. I remember as a young person asking a, one question, why do people do what they do when they have power? It mystified me that when people got very powerful, the values often, changed, right? Well, yes, and they created a world that was worse than what they inherited. Or and what they so, had promised to change, right? And what they had <laughs> promised to change. So I've interviewed many, many dictators. I've interviewed many world leaders and really always asked this question and pursued it. And I think it's really driven a lot of what I do in life because you know, my, my parents taught me respect and compassion for those who don't have in the world. Now, when you talk about a transition from both the private sector and uh, you know, the management career into government, there's some lessons you learn when that you make transition or there's some things you actually carry with you. Right. Which ones did you carry with you and which ones did you have to build on as right. you went into the government? Right. Well, I'm a believer in business and its power to change the world. So I believe and I learned in business 
that you can actually leverage the examples of business to bring opportunity to people in the world. And so I started really working with a man named Jack Kemp, who was a real a positive football star, right? football star uh, yes. and ran for vice president yes. of the U.S. But his whole thing was economic empowerment. You know, don't necessarily give aid to people. Give them a chance to make their so life government better. So is there to enable things that the private sector fuels Right, government. and not block them. And sometimes it looks yeah. like government's blocking and creating obstacles to the very people that are driving opportunity and job creation. I did feel it was important to really devote my life for a period of my life to really directly working on those issues rather than through business, because I think it's very indirect through business, which is great. But um, you know, I did move much more directly into work that I think can help change people's lives, yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, you, said, you talk about the State Department. Some people see it as a monolith. Some people see it as where the rubber meets the road in terms of right. making development work. Tell us, as the Undersecretary of State for Business, Agriculture, and Economic Affairs, how do you carve out that role and mandate and make it more, even more responsive, especially to the least developing countries? Well, this is the role in the State Department that actually created the Marshall Plan. And I really felt so honored to take on this office. This was the office that helped rebuild Europe and Asia after the wars. Funds, yeah. Yes, exactly. And that vision to say you can't build peace on an empty stomach. I mean, that was a central idea of the creation of that office at State Department. And I feel the economic diplomacy and that kind of development diplomacy is really a hallmark of what makes America great. Um, you look at you know the legacy when America did things right, and it was really extending a hand to former enemies or to those who were conquered in wars or defeated in wars and saying, you know, let us work side by side with you to build a better future. So uh, that particular office, you know, we did many things, including help Pakistan respond to the massive earthquake. Um, I got to know Philippines through its response to many typhoons and uh, became involved in really reform of the United Nations and other bodies. We may not know how to stop all cancer, but we know how to stop hunger. And so I thought, I want to devote my life to tackling hunger in the world. Give us an example also of how that private sector mindset crept or even influenced the way you actually structured programs, right. engage with other stakeholders, and you know, and got things done. Right. Well, when I was at the State Department, I was nominated by the United States to head the United Nations World Food Program. There, um, they move uh, about 30 billion meals a year to people. It is the largest humanitarian organization on record, so that you have a massive mandate right. and under resources to use it. But how, how do you make sure private sector efficiency and responsiveness goes into such a large right. organization? Well, I went there really passionate about the issue of hunger, but wanting to help reform the institution, which whose heart was in the right place. These are the heroes of the world, and they have no weapons, and they go into war zones and disaster zones and make sure kids have food. But for example, even though they handled billions of dollars of food and medicine on behalf of the whole UN in their massive supply chain to these areas, they had no barcoding. They didn't have proper you know, warehouse management tools. Uh, they didn't have proper tracking devices for the trucks. So when I came on, we had something like 15 of our drivers kidnapped in Darfur, and we didn't know where to find them or their trucks because we didn't have satellite tracking devices. And so one of the biggest things I did was bring in leaders of the private sector from around the world to help us understand top supply chain management and controls All of these private sector chain. business tools, yes. Yes, and for us it wasn't about getting out another penny of profit. It was about saving another life. If we could prevent loss of food, if we could prevent spoilage of food, if we could ensure quicker delivery, 
we could save kids' lives. And so, you know, this is really a passionate thing for me. Well, yeah. to set part of the thing about the private sector is try to measure things. There's a saying that goes, if you don't measure it, it doesn't get managed, right? right? So at the end of the day, to what extent have you seen those programs change over time, even beyond mm -hmm. your departure from the World Food Program, in terms of how that impact has been more uh, lasting and sustainable? Well, I think the world's moved in the right direction. For example, when I came to the World Food Program, the cup of food that the kids would get every day, um, we would measure the kilocalories. How many kilocalories were they getting? But never the micronutrients. And we now know if the children aren't getting the right micronutrients, their brains can be damaged for life, especially if they're under two years old. So we added a measurement for micronutrient access and we were very conscious of people with HIV AIDS, of young children, of pregnant uh, women who are especially vulnerable and need very specific micronutrients or else even though you don't see, their brain is actually dying and their body is stunting. And so we see terrible stunting in the world. Uh, and you know, our goal came to prevent that, not just the hunger in the stomach, but the you know, hidden hunger of the human body and the human mind. And so we began measuring that, which was really uh, a bold new step. And the other thing we measured was not just did we save a life. It's easy to measure how many cups of food got to people and the next day they were alive, but it was different to measure were they healthy, were they thriving. All these so were nuanced could, indicators, yeah. So they could then lead a, a healthy lives. life someday and not suffering irreversible damage. So that really became our goal. We raised the bar tremendously. It's, yeah. it's, it's fascinating just yeah. to look at not just outputs, a typical government agency, even in the Philippines, we look at checking off lists and rather than looking at the outcomes. And right. so it's interesting to see that it happen in a large humanitarian organization. Right. Now I want to get your views also about hunger in the Philippines. Self-rated hunger is here. Despite right. the economic growth, it's still high, but w from your experience and now even at the Asia Society, right. how do you feel the most impactful and most responsive way can be you know, implemented in the Philippines, for right. example, or a developing country? Right. Well, first, this comes from really a, a personal passion that I have for this issue. After my first daughter was born, I was watching television while I held her, and a picture of the famine in Ethiopia came on. And there was a mother holding her baby, and the baby was crying for food and the mother could give the baby nothing, and the baby died in her arms. But I remember feeling so outraged because we know how to stop hunger. We may not know how to stop all cancer, but we know how to stop hunger. And so as a young mother, I thought, I want to devote my life to tackling hunger in the world. In the Philippines, we see so many young people losing their eyesight, losing the strength of their mind and body, because in a young age they're denied proper nutrition. It actually does not cost that much. It's about 20 cents a day to make sure a kid has adequate nutrition to be able to have a healthy mind and body so someday they can lift themselves out of poverty. I think this should be non-negotiable for the whole world. That a child has a right to a full mind and a full body, not the stunting that so many are afflicted with, and I think it has to be a priority for every government. When I headed the World Food Program, I wanted to talk to the finance ministers, not the development ministers, because I think the case for getting this right is so compelling that national presidents and prime ministers and finance ministers should do it out of selfishness to make their country better. You made better. the economics very clear already, the yeah. returns, right? Yeah, exactly. So. Um, so for the Philippines, you know, I see a nation on the rise. I see people aspiring. This has become an aspirational nation. I think the Philippines has tasted enough of the potential of the future that your young people are saying, we want to be part of the world. We're not going to be left behind. And even I've met people who have come out of the slums and they want more. They want education for their kids. They want to be part of the world. And I see in the Philippines that if they were given an equal opportunity, these could be leaders of global businesses or global NGOs. So I really feel it's time for uh, governments to enable people to be able to start their own enterprises and get on with their own lives. 
think the transformation of Asia is the biggest story of our time. So to me, the most exciting thing is looking at the nexus of opportunity there. Certainly, I mean, those tools and best practices are there. And what's interesting enough is you, you can talk about your stint at the World Economic Forum as vice chair. When you, look, when you look at that assemblage of all this talent, leadership, and resources, tell us how you navigated that and instill more best practices and then apply them in your current position. Sure. Well, places like the World Economic Forum, to me, were a platform to get great things done. When you have that much talent in the room, that much money in the room, that much potential, what can you do with it? This is how I, I face every challenge. I first got to know the World Economic Forum when I was really fighting hunger with the World Food Program. And we gathered, for the first time, the leaders of all the top food industries in the world and said, you're all competitors. But to end child stunting, can you all put all hands on one wheel and work together? That transformation started the global fight against malnutrition and stunting of children. And we were able to raise three, over $300 million for our work through the world. By, by, again, marshalling economic all these economic uh, exactly. engines together. Yeah, and making a plan of action that they could see could be successful. We also brought supply chains, global supply chains together. So when I went to work at the World Economic Forum, it was really to look at those top global projects where that group of talent could be transformed to do something good. Well, what's, what's interesting now, as you said, is you're actually in a narrower focus with the Asia Society, but nonetheless a very critical focus, especially as the region takes a big spotlight in terms of growth and opportunity. Tell us about your transition to the Asia Society and what changes have you made to apply everything you've learned prior to that? Well, the fact is I saw in my work in the U.S. government and in the uh, United Nations a big gap in the world, and that was a gap in recognizing the talent and the vision and the rise of Asia and the importance of inclusion of Asia into the power tables of the world to help jointly make decisions about the future of the world. This had not really been happening before and I felt it was a huge and dangerous gap. The Asia Society is devoted to that very issue. John D. Rockefeller III, 60 years ago, saw that gap so many institutions focused on U.S.-Europe relations, but none on U.S.-Asia yes. relations. And so um, I felt this was really the biggest gap in the global scene that I saw. So it, I narrowed very specifically to try to get that right and bring Asia to the table of the world in a way where it had its respected place and where people could really see the talent and voices of Asia fully. Well, it's interesting also to see that you are the public face of the Asia side, but internally also there's a bit of a transition that I've seen. As, a, mm -hmm. as an Asia 21 fellow, I see that as well, that there's an increased focus beyond culture and the arts into governance, into inclusive mm -hmm. business. Tell us about how your, uh, your m moves and your initiatives right. have actually s uh, led that way right. towards that kind of programming. Right. Well, this was actually John D. Rockefeller's original vision that Asia society would look at policy and art and culture and education. But I wanted to come to really bring that up even further in our work. The fact is today, no problem in the world can be solved without Asia at the table, none. And the fact is more people have been lifted out of poverty in the past 30 years in Asia than all of human history combined. This has all the opportunity in the world and all the danger and challenge that we've seen historically when new powers rise up challenging established powers. And so we feel this work is the most important work of our time to ensure that Asia's rise, that we, t we get all of the opportunity out of that for the people of Asia and the West, and we reduce the chances and challenges for conflict. Well, it's you've come a long way since that phone call with your father <laughs> in 1979, and you know 30 plus years yeah. have passed. Tell us in hindsight, 
What surprised you about the growth of this region and your trajectory towards it? Would you have changed anything? Mm -hmm. And what, what is next for Jusat Shiran? Yeah. So I've just been living in Asia for the past three months. I've moved Asia Society's headquarters now to share between Asia and the U.S. And, you know, I wish I did that earlier. I think that nothing can replace really implanting yourself in a region where you see the world through the eyes of people there and you feel the heartbeat of what's happening. I think the transformation of Asia is the biggest story of our time. And I believe greatly this will you know, be America's century, but it will be Asia's century also. So to me, the most exciting thing is looking at the nexus of opportunity there. So I told my kids, if I were them today, I'd be living in Asia. I'd be really feeling it from the ground up because there is no story quite like what's happening in Asia. Manila is predicted to be one of this, the number two rising city by Kearney Report uh, in the next few years. You can feel it here. You can feel the change. And it feels to me like Silicon Valley 20 years ago. So uh, to me, uh, what I would change is really being part of that and learning the languages, which is something really important at Asia Society, is helping the world who doesn't know the languages of Asia access those. Well, you said, you know, there's an interesting Chinese motto that says that may we live in interesting times. It certainly is an interesting time to be in, and I appreciate sharing your leadership views on it mm -hmm. and your life story as we make our way towards this next, you know, set of decades wherein Asia has so much upside. Thank you so much for your time, Giuseppe. Yeah, appreciate thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> From ameliorating world hunger to unleashing the full potential of this dynamic region called Asia, Jusat Shiran's life of leadership shows us how the power of personal heroic example and an unwavering commitment to empowerment can transform lives for good and carve a path wide enough and accessible enough for all of us to follow. My name is Kintun Pastrana. Join me again next week as I explore the lives and the moves of the countries and regions most successful people.